So hello, my name is Miri Van Hoven and I'm the Acting Dean and Associate Dean for Research in the College of Science. I am very happy to welcome you all to our second, both in-person and Zoom, College of Science Research Talk. Um, today we are very lucky to have Dr. Ben Carter um, from Biological Sciences who has um, uh, volunteered to go early in the semester. I know we're having two biology in a row, and normally I go to a lot of trouble to make sure we space out all the different departments. But in this case, the two biology folks took pity on me and volunteered to go early in the semester. So um, thanks so much for that, Ben. <laughs> so let me introduce Ben. Um, Ben actually is a veteran of the CSU, having done his BS in Ecology and Systems uh, Systematic Biology at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He then did his PhD in Integrative Biology at UC Berkeley and his dissertation on Systemics and Ecology of the Moss Genus Scleropodium. Um, then he went on to do his postdoctoral research at Duke under John Shaw and joined us here at San Jose State University as an assistant professor in 2015. In 2021, he moved up the ranks to associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences here at San Jose State University. And he has also served since coming as the director of the Sharsmith Herbarium at San Jose State University, which if you haven't heard about it, has a wealth of really, um, exciting and useful um, samples that are used by a wide variety of researchers throughout the United States, possibly even other countries. So um, quite, um, quite an amazing resource we have there. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ben so he can tell us all about his research, um, which is all, all focused in plant biology and trying to understand plant distribution using new methods um, to understand this ancient problem. And I will go ahead and mute so that you can talk then. All right, thanks, Mary. And um, let me just share my screen here. Uh, thank you all for coming, I appreciate it. Um, sharing a Friday afternoon with me. Um, are we okay with the screen share there? Is that working? Yep. Okay. Great. Great. Um, let's uh, let's get started. Um, uh, so thanks for the nice introduction, and, and we'll definitely be talking about the herbarium, which uh, is definitely a it's a really cool resource that students have on campus, and I'm excited to share some stories about that uh, with you today. Um, and I want to start off. Uh, with this artist rendition of what's called the Three Sisters. Um, and this is a, uh, an agricultural practice um, that was developed by Native Americans here in North America. Um, and it relies on three crop species, uh, corn and beans and squash. Uh, and I want to start with this because uh, it's a nice illustration of, of how uh, people have been thinking about um, plants and their distributions and their interactions with each other and their interactions with the environment uh, for a very, very, very long time. Um, and so some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today is just sort of a modern perspective on what humanity has been doing uh, for as long as there have been people. Um, and this system is uh, is really cool um, because it it's very complementary. So the corn stalks grow tall. And then the, the beans are vines, which kind of when you wind around the corn stalks and then the squash, sort of a flatter crop. So uh, the Native American people could grow all these together in the same plots of land without too much competition among species. Uh, and what's even more cool is that the, um, the amino acids produced by each of these three crops when consumed together um, provide a, a kind of a balanced diet of proteins um, so that you actually don't have to eat any meat, which is a really important part of um, the kind of, um, agricultural system here in the U.S. before European settlement, um, because we here in North America, there weren't any animals that were kind of pre-adapted to cultivation. Um, so, so again, the, the point of this is not to talk about agriculture, but to talk about the, the interest that humans naturally have in where species live and uh, the relationships that we have to them. Um, 
And, and these days we have very different uh, priorities when we're thinking about species distributions uh, and species interactions. And so this is a very familiar landscape um, over here, um, the kind of the human footprint encroaching on our wild lands um, that we see all around the Bay Area. Uh, and of course, all of us here are very familiar with wildfires and their impacts on our air quality, um, but also on the ecosystems that surround us. And um, so humans have been playing with fire in the California landscape for thousands of years, um, but things have changed dramatically over the last 50 years, um, in, in part because of our, our own management practices, uh, as well as um, what's happening in the environment, uh, which, is, which is also caused by us. Uh, and then over on the right here is a um, just projection of what sea levels might look like in a few years, um, given a, a five foot increase in, in sea levels. Um, so there's a, a ton of different plants and animals that are adapted to that really interesting zone where the land meets the salt water. Um, and unfortunately, that's an area that people are really interested in too. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of really sensitive species that are gonna be really highly impacted. Um, and so these are all just a few of the many, many questions that we're interested in uh, these days when we're talking about uh, plant distributions and conservation of, of plants. Um, so I just want to, uh, this is one of my favorite figures um, in the recent literature, and I want to kind of walk, uh, walk you through it, because um, this is definitely how I see the world is, is through maps. Um, and I just want to define a term real quick. So endemism in the context of ecology and biogeography uh, is we use the word slightly differently than people use it in, in common speech. Um, so an endemic, and I'll probably use that word in this talk, uh, an endemic is a species that occurs in one part of the world and nowhere else in the world. So a species that's unique to a particular region. And so that's how we'll use it for this talk. Um, and so the, the kind of take home from this is uh, if you look uh, across the rows, those are different groups. So we got mammals on top and then birds and amphibians. Uh, and then if you look down the columns, um, on the left-hand side, we've got uh, patterns of total species richness. So that's kind of biodiversity. And then on the right-hand side, we have the richness of endemic. So that's the, the richness only of species that, that live just in, in the US. And the take home from this is if you look across the rows, the patterns are often super different, right? So uh, if we're thinking about this from a conservation perspective and you want to, you're interested in the conservation of mammals, uh, if you want to preserve a lot of species, you look over here in Western North America. But if you want to preserve the species that only live here, then, you know, you look in a totally different place. Um, and so if you look across the rows, you see a lot of differences. So these things are um, challenges that, that we face in conservation. Uh, and then, of course, as you might expect, as you go down, down the columns and look at the different groups of organisms, um, they peak in different places. And so there again, you know, in terms of establishing our, our conservation priorities, you know, what we learn about mammals doesn't, doesn't translate to reptiles. And what we learn about reptiles doesn't translate to plants. And what we learn about trees doesn't, um, doesn't tran translate to ferns. Uh, and so it's really important that we kind of branch out throughout the tree of life when we're thinking about uh, how to preserve uh, the species that haven't gone extinct yet. Um, and, and so that's, that's what we need. Oh, yeah, let's see. How do I minimize that? I can't see it. Oh, you can't see it? No, just on the screen. Yeah. Just that. Sorry. Oh, this one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, so, so my lab is interested in these um, kind of very spatially oriented conservation questions. And we use kind of two suites of, of tools um, and two general approaches. One of them is museum science and field studies. And so this is actually working with physical specimens or the data from physical specimens that we go out and collect in nature. Um, so this is a, a photo of one of our cabinets um, showing one of our more than 25,000 specimens now in the, the herbarium, which is a room in, in Duncan Hall. Uh, and so we, add, we use these things to, to ask questions like where do species live and where are the um, hotspots of uh, species richness and where do the rare species live. Um, and once we identify those patterns and we can, we can ask those, those kind of interesting mechanistic questions of why those distributions exist. Um, and then we have a, a whole nother suite of questions uh, around 
uh, the genomics and um, kind of classical greenhouse studies asking, uh, what is this species? And um, that may seem like a trivial question, but especially in plants, it's, it's absolutely not. Like there's no real good definition for what a species actually is out in nature that, that works uniformly across the different branches of the tree of life. Um, and, and so we work on those questions um, because of course they relate. So if you're interested in where species live, you have to sort of have some concept of what species actually are. Um, and then, of course, if you're interested in what is a species, that means you have to figure out what causes new species to form. Um, and so different members of my research lab are all kind of interested in different pieces of these questions. And that's going to, um, going to be the focus of the talk today is, is looking at these. Um, and the way that I think about these problems uh, is in a little kind of three-dimensional space like this. Um, and so it's my world very much uh, intellectually exists in here. So we've got time on, on one axis space on another axis, and then the proportion of the tree of life, so how much evolutionary history is on a different axis. And depending on where you're, you are studying in this three-dimensional space, you, know, you kind of get different answers. And, and um, the answer in one corner of this box doesn't necessarily scale up to or scale down uh, to another part of this box. Um, and so what we do in the lab is we kind of take everything from down in this corner, which an example would be a, you know, a focal study on a single population of a single species or at a single place at a single point in time, um, all the way up to things in this corner, um, which are um, you know, lots and lots of species across really broad distributions uh, and studying processes that, that occur over tens of thousands or even millions of years. Um, and so we're going to kind of uh, zoom in and out um, on different places in this box um, today. And we're going to spend most of the time up in this corner. Um, but just really quickly, I want to kind of take you into this corner because this is where all the kind of really fun natural history happens. Um, and so uh, I just want to talk real briefly about a study that uh, one of my former undergrads, Anjum Gujral, did. And she's actually now starting her PhD at Davis um, and uh, after finishing a, a master's at San Francisco State. And so she was interested in the natural history of this super rare plant called Dudley's Lousewort. Uh, it just lives in two places in the world, uh, in Portola Redwood State Park, and then down here in Monterey County. Uh, and in a good year, there'll be maybe 1,500 individuals in the world of this species, so super, super rare. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to figure out is why the, the species is so rare. And so if you study uh, the natural history of the organism, a lot of times you can find, you know, for a rare plant, you can find the pinch point, the thing that's causing it to be rare. And so that's what Anjum was, was looking for. Um, and so here uh, is a, a native bee uh, that's pollinating this thing. So at first we were thinking about maybe it's pollinators that are the limiting factor um, and it wasn't that. And um, we kind of went through and, and we're ticking off, off a lot of boxes of what it could and couldn't be. And then one of the things that Anjum found was uh, a really interesting relationship with these yellow jackets. So you can see this yellow jacket is kind of crawling in. And what it's actually doing is it's crawling into a seed pod uh, of this plant. Um, and so when we think about uh, yellow jackets, uh, we tend to think about um, things like this, you know, like how to keep them out of your picnic. And, um, you know, they're kind of a, they're kind of a nuisance plant. You know, this, this image I, I stole from killthewasp.com, which I think says a lot about our relationship to yellow jackets. Um, but as it turns out, um, these wasps, what they'll do is they'll, they'll kind of sneak into these seed pods and this is what the, the normal seeds look like. Um, you can see there's kind of a spongy looking coating on the outside of them. Uh, and these are pretty big. They're about as big as like a, a grain of short grain rice. And so fairly big seed. Um, and then when the wasps get in there, you can see there's like all that coating has been kind of chipped off or scraped off. So there's something about that coating and we don't know yet what it is. There's something that they really like and they're attracted to. So they'll actually reach in and if they can't take the seed physically, they'll just scratch off that coating and if they can grab it, it's, it's about 20% the size of their body. So it's huge relative to them. They'll stick their arms around it and fly off of it. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that you can, you can find out with these like really intimate natural history studies. Is, um, these totally, uh, um, uh, these, these things that we never would have expected um, about the nat natural history, like things like these nuisance wasps uh, would be super important for the seed dispersal of a rare plant. Um, so a lot of fun stuff happens here, and, and uh, the undergrads really like this. But again, I, I want to kind of um, focus more on these real big picture um, conservation questions for today's talk. Um, 
Um, and that means uh, talking about my favorite group of organisms, uh, which are called the bryophytes. Uh, and this is one of the groups of plants. And so when we think about plants, usually we're thinking about the flowering plants. Um, so this is a little evolutionary tree showing the relationship to the major groups of plants. Um, so the, the algae are kind of out here on the edge of it. Um, and here's the flowering plants that you have in your yard. And then maybe you're familiar with gymnosperms. These are the, the plants that have seeds but don't produce flowers. Um, and then ferns are over here. So they're relatives of, of the flowering plants, but they don't produce seeds and they produce spores. And then way out here, diverging something like 450 million years ago from the, the rest of the plants are uh, the bryophytes. And there's three groups of them. Uh, you maybe have heard about mosses and maybe have not heard about liverworts and hornworts. Um, but this is a pretty important group of plants in California. Um, so this is, it represents about 10% of our native diversity of, um, of native California plants. Um, so they're small, but they're, they're significant. Um, and just a little kind of introduction, so you probably aren't familiar with them. Um, some of the most fun things that I think about uh, when I think about mosses is uh, the first things are life cycle. And uh, as an undergraduate, I never thought that learning plant life cycles would be important, um, but it turns out it, it really is for the mosses. And so here is a basic life cycle uh, for any sexually reproducing organism. And so all the complicated life cycles that you see in algae and fungi and all the protist groups um, they all kind of boil down to this, these four basic parts. So you have a diploid phase, that's where you have two sets of chromosomes. And then there's an alternate phase, that's the haploid phase, that's where there's one set of chromosomes. And then to get from one to another, there's these two important processes of meiosis, which goes from diploid to haploid. Um, so in, in us, that's happening in our testes and ovaries. Uh, and then uh, fertilization, where you get two haploid cells uh, coming together to form a diploid cell. Um, so as vertebrates, we hang out in this part of the life cycle, uh, and then meiosis happens in our, our sex organs. Uh, and then all that's happening here, it's a lot of fun for us humans, but it's not really an important part of our life cycle, what happens between meiosis and fertilization. Um, and that's really different from a moss, which spends most of its life over in this haploid section. Um, and so when you look at a green moss on the ground, it's actually haploid, uh, and then um, its offspring is diploid, and that's this stalk right here. So the, the haploid and diploid phases are, um, are morphologically very different from one another. And so the sporophyte, so the diploid generation, is just around um, for meiosis, essentially. So it's kind of the opposite to the way our life cycle is. Um, they, they also disperse by little unicellular spores, so they're wind dispersed, which will come into play in a minute. Um, and then the other interesting thing about them is that they, they have very, very few kind of ecological interactions with other species. Um, so they don't have seeds, and they don't have flowers, and they don't have roots. Um, they don't have vascular tissue, and they're not that exciting to herbivores. And so when we're interested in talking about like how do new plant species form, and why do some plant species live here and other ones live there, most of our um, explanations come from these things. And so when we're, when we're looking at mosses, it's kind of interesting because you don't have all these factors. And so it's gotta be something else that drives their distributions. Um, and so some of the ways that plays out are, um, are ways that the mosses are very different uh, from other plants and other organisms. So one of the most universal rules, it's almost a law in, in biogeography, um, is something called the global latitudinal diversity gradient. And it's very simple. Um, so on the x-axis here is here's the south pole and the equator and the north pole. So this is latitude. Um, and on the y-axis here is species richness. So what we see in almost every group of organisms uh, is that diversity is very low at the poles. It peaks at the equator and then you know, down at the other pole. Um, mosses, uh, it's basically a flat line. And so there is no diversity gradient globally. Um, and it's for a lot of complicated reasons. Um, but it's really cool because they're one of the very few groups of organisms on Earth that, that break that fundamental rule. Um, one of the other things, and this relates to the, the unicellular um, spores that get wind dispersed, is there's very few invasive species. Um, and invasive species are the number two threat to biodiversity behind uh, habitat loss. 
Um, and so, um, so as a frame of reference in California, um, introduced species are about 20% of the plants that you see if you go for a hike. Um, whereas uh, introduced mosses um, are going to be uh, about a half a percent. Um, so there's very few invasive species. Um, so that gets me to the kind of biogeographical questions that I'm really interested in, um, which is what is the evolutionary history of mosses tell us about where they live across North America? So we're looking at kind of really big picture continent-wide distributions. Um, and so the, the data set that I'm going to talk about um, comes from, this is an herbarium specimen, so it's got a little label on it telling uh, what the species is, where it was collected, when it was collected. Um, so we take lots and lots of these uh, out of the herbarium and from herbaria all across the, the country and the world um, and turn each one of those specimens into a dot on a map. Um, and then for each uh, species, you can overlay all those to make species richness maps. So this is a, a diversity heat map. And that tells us where species live in the continent. Um, and then we can go to GenBank and we can get DNA sequences uh, for a lot of these species. And so we can make evolutionary trees. So then you have a map overlaid on a phylogeny or an evolutionary tree showing how all these things are related. Um, so then we can do what's called spatial phylogenetics, um, which is an emerging field uh, that, that studies spatial patterns in evolutionary history. Um, and so we're looking not at patterns of species diversity, but patterns of evolutionary diversity, which is kind of different. Um, so let's talk about how that's, how that's different um, in just a real simple case. Um, so imagine that you're up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and you're at a spot and you find four species, and then you go down to Alum Rock Park and go to another site and you find a different four species. Um, so if we're looking at patterns of species richness, those two places are equivalent. Um, but if we're looking at phylogenetic diversity, they might not be equivalent. Um, and here's how that could work. Um, so let's say this is a little evolutionary tree of species. And so if one of those sites has species C, D, E, and F in blue here. So you can see those are all clustered together evolutionarily. So they're all really close relatives to one another. Uh, and then maybe at our other site, we've got species A, C, uh, G, and J. Um, so those species are all distant, distantly related to one another. So if we're looking at species richness, we see the same number, four species. But if we're looking at phylogenetic diversity, we get a really different story. Really close relatives versus really distant, distant relatives. Um, and that can provide information uh, that's really um, important to understanding how those species got to those places. Um, and I'll show you some maps in a, in a second to illustrate that. Um, but so the, the basic idea is that phylogenetic diversity uh, correlates pretty closely with richness, and that makes sense. So the more species you have at a site, um, so each one of these dots would represent a geographic region on the planet, anywhere you know, it could be little or big, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, the, the point here is the richness and phylogenetic diversity of correlate. Um, and so as you increase the number of species in a region, you're sampling for more tips on the tree of life. And so you're going to get more phylogenetic diversity, more of the evolutionary tree within that set of species. <clears throat> um, but what's really interesting is when we find regions that, uh, based on the number of species we find, have either really high phylogenetic diversity or really low phylogenetic diversity. Um, so this line represents our kind of expected amount of phylogenetic diversity based on richness. And so these blue regions uh, have much greater phylogenetic diversity than you'd expect. Um, and then these red points have much lower phylogenetic diversity um, than you'd expect. Um, and we have statistical ways of kind of putting this stuff all on the map and, and doing some um, fancy statistical tests to actually determine which one of these are, are more, uh, have more phylogenetic diversity or, or less than you'd expect based on a null model. Um, and so these have um, kind of ecological interpretations. Um, so if you have high phylogenetic diversity, um, usually these are areas that are ecologically stable. And so there's a lot of strong competition and the, the kind of driving ecological factors are biological. So species on species interactions. Um, where, whereas if you have low phylogenetic diversity, usually that's an indication of harsh environmental conditions and really strong filtering by the environment. So basically you have a bunch of species that all have the same adaptations to deal with some harsh environment. And usually that means they're closely related to each other. So those are all tied together. Um, and then there's a separate metric called relative phylogenetic diversity, 
um, that can give us an indication of, of places that have a lot of really old lineages, which means there hasn't been much extinction in that place, um, or a lot of really young lineages, meaning there's been a bunch of recent diversification in that region. And so by comparing these two metrics, um, we can get an evolutionary history of a biota. Um, so let me just kind of lay the stage of, of the questions that I was interested in, um, which uh, originated in, in this simple question of, of why are some mosses restricted to North America and some are not? Um, so about 80% of our North American mosses uh, are also native to another continent, mostly Europe and Asia, but also South America, Australia, uh, Africa, and other places. Um, so the question I was interested in is, is what's the difference between these 80% that live on this continent and another continent, and then those 20% that live only on this continent? Um, and it turns out they're super different. Um, so these maps uh, are um, maps of, of all the species that, uh, so the non-endemics are the widespread species that also occur on other continents, and each dot represents the geographic average, like the midpoint of the distribution of a species. Um, and then over here in purple are the species that only live in North America. And so you can see that these are uh, really clearly divided into two groups, and you can look at the histograms down below. Um, so longitudinally, so here's the, the West Coast peak and then the East Coast peak. Um, so the, the ones that only live here on this continent are bimodal, and the, the ones that are widespread are unimodal. Um, and then you can also notice in the latitude that the, uh, the purple bar here is shifted to the left, meaning that the, the ones that only live here uh, are more Southern in distribution. Um, and the, the ones that only live here uh, also have significantly smaller ranges. Um, so what we have here in terms of the whole flora of the continent um, is really three distinctly different sets of species. Uh, one group that has big ranges, occurs offset to the north, and also occurs on other continents. One group that only lives in Western North America, and another group that only lives in Eastern North America. So the question is, what's the origin story of these three different groups? And this is where we get into the, um, the phylogenetic stuff. Um, but first, a little kind of a reminder of the geological history of North America. Um, so this is an artist's illustration of uh, the last glacial maximum in the Pleistocene. So here's Alaska up here. Here's the Bay Area. Here's the Great Lakes to kind of get you oriented. And so here's the ice sheet. Um, so the, the hypothesis that explains that, that uh, gray group, the group of widespread ones, is basically you have this suite of species that uh, can tolerate those, those harsh northern conditions, uh, but they can also tolerate all the migration north and south and north and south and north and south that happened throughout the Pleistocene. Um, and so you basically have this ring around the top of the planet throughout the northern hemisphere in uh, you know, Scandinavia and Siberia and Canada. And it's basically just a common flora around that ring um, that are all both able to deal with the current conditions and could, could make it through the crisis. Um, so that kind of really nicely explains that northern group. Um, but that doesn't explain how we ended up with this separate eastern and western um, groups. That, that only live on this continent. Um, so this is where the evolutionary history stuff comes in. Um, so uh, these are two maps showing the two different metrics I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is the phylogenetic diversity. So this is how closely these species are related to one another. And then this is the relative phylogenetic diversity. This is an indication of the, um, the branch length. So like the old versus the young species. And the thing that jumps out about both of these maps is all this blue down here in the Southeast. Um, so what we've got here is, is really high evolutionary diversity, so lots and lots of lineages, um, and then lots of really old lineages. Um, and so this is a really, really clear indication of relictualism. Um, so this is an area that didn't get um, blasted by the Pleistocene glaciations. Um, and then also it didn't really get uh, disturbed by something that happened earlier in geological history, which is the Miocene aridification. Um, so the, the Miocene goes from about uh, 20 million years ago to about 5 million years ago. Um, and during that period, the whole western half of the continent dried out. Um, and so the southeast was very stable throughout both of those time periods, uh, which is what gives us this, this signal. Um, and not coincidentally, if you look down, the, you remember this figure, look down the endemics column, uh, and all these things are peaking in the southeast, right? And so um, 
a lot of that endemism is driven by that long-term stability through geological time across, across the tree of um, And then over in the Southwest, you can see uh, there's, there's a lot of red in this, this map. That means the, the species are really closely related. Um, and then kind of a, a smattering of red, but not nearly as much over in this one. So this tells us that the species are very closely related and they're kind of youngish, but, but not, so, not so young. And um, this is really interesting in the context of what the vascular plants were doing, um, which looks like this. This is from a, another paper by some colleagues of mine. Um, and so uh, we're comparing this map to this map. And so this is just a, a sea of red over here where as we just get kind of a smattering of red. So basically the response of the, the flowering plants to the Miocene aridification was to diversify, make lots of little young lineages. So that's all the red. Whereas in the mosses, you could just get the smattering. So there was some diversification, but really it's just colonization from lineages that were already adapted to those arid conditions from other parts of the world. So you see a really different response uh, between these two groups of um, plants. Um, so I'm really interested in that kind of uh, those basic kind of origin story questions. Um, but I, I had a student recently, uh, Sandina Wagner, who just graduated this spring, who's really interested in putting that stuff in a conservation context explicitly. Um, so she was interested in how these patterns of phylogenetic diversity and species richness um, kind of overlay with land costs and, and land use status, so which areas are already conserved or not. And so when you put these things together, um, it turns out that the, uh, like if we, could, if we could really preserve the best piece of land um, to conserve uh, moss evolutionary diversity, uh, we'd actually want to get some land down here around Tampa, Florida, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive. Like if you think about where's the mossiest places you've ever been, uh, if you've ever been to Washington or New England, it's there, right? But if we want to conserve evolutionary diversity, no, we, we, we shop in Tampa. Um, unfortunately, land is super expensive in Tampa. And so when Tandina overlaid uh, cost of, of land um, into the equation, um, then the, the kind of two places we want to focus on are, are Southern Louisiana and Northern Maine. Um, and so the, the story here is, is, this is kind of a hypothetical exercise, but this is how we need to think about conservation at these scales, right? Is, is it's not just species richness, it's evolutionary diversity. And it's not just those two things, it's in the kind of the practical context of things like which lands are already protected and how much does it cost to buy new land. Um, and so uh, I was really happy that, that Candiana worked on that um, and she's working on writing up a paper. Um, and um, just a kind of to, to talk about a couple other students' work, um, these big kind of continent scale projects um, are the result of kind of the accumulation of hundreds and hundreds of people working for literally hundreds of years to figure out these distributions. Um, and so the two kind of projects that really feed into these big projects are um, projects that we do in the lab. Uh, so John McLaughlin, one of my current students, uh, is doing a biodiversity inventory. So he's just going out to, to Henry Coe State Park, which is right near San Jose, and just doing an inventory, crawling through the poison oak and the ticks to find new species of moss that live out there, um, and finding some really, really cool stuff that we didn't know was there. And that's the only way that we can find uh, this stuff is to go out and look, or at least to have our grad students go out and look. Uh, and then the other kind of really important work is taxonomic work. Um, so basically figuring out what's a species and what's the difference between this species and that species. So another one of my uh, current students, Lars Lieber, um, is, is doing that for a, a group of species. And maybe it's one or maybe it's two or maybe it's five, we're not really sure. Um, but she's sorting that out with herbarium specimens and genetic data. Um, and uh, so one of the things that you know, we think of is that you know, we should be done with this process by now, right? It's, it's 2020. Um, but uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite figures I've ever published. Uh, and I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, so here's the year 1800, and here's the year 2000. Um, and this is just an accumulation of all the species of moss that have been described um, formally from, from North America. And so if we were kind of done with finding new species, what you'd expect is the line to go kind of steeply up and then hit a plateau and then just flatline for a while. And what you can see is this 
is kind of the opposite of that, right? Look, like, look at the slope here. Like we're just shooting out, finding new species all over the place um, because of the work of people like John and, and Lark. And, and what is really cool to me about this is if you look at the slope right here, you know, the increase in new species over time, it's kind of comparable to the slope right here. And if you look at the years here, so that's between 1850 and 1900, that's like the westward expansion of naturalists associated with the railroad surveys and the geological survey. So basically when all the people that had training from Europe and, and places like Harvard and Yale first came out west and started documenting all the plants and animals that lived out here, um, we're in a period of, of species discovery that's comparable to that period in Mossy, right, which is really cool. Um, and I just wanna highlight a couple other students work because these museum specimens are really useful not only for looking at patterns of species through space, but also um, trends through time. And so another one of my recent students, Alex Rinker, um, who's actually an ornithologist, was really interested in the conservation of this super rare sparrow that lives only at that special place that I mentioned earlier where the salt water meets the land in the, in the San Francisco Bay. Um, and they want to conserve the habitat for this bird, but they don't know what the habitat is because it's all trashed by people um, and by the, you know all the, the kind of paving and everything else we've done out there. Um, so what he did was use 100-year-old museum specimens and got DNA out of the plants that the birds used to make those specimens to come up with species lists that the plants picked 100 years ago so that they know what plants to, to plant in their conservation sites to try to restore the habitat uh, for these birds. Um, so really, really cool stuff. And uh, another one of my recent students, uh, David Vu, um, was interested in how climate change affects flowering time in plants over the last 150 years in California. So he was working on this little wildflower uh, called wine cups. Um, and these preserved herbarium specimens, they have a date and an exact location on them, which is super useful. Um, and then they also capture the phenological state uh, for plants. So um, they tell us where uh, where the plant was in its kind of developmental trajectory. Um, and so we can count the number of buds and the number of flowers and the number of fruits. And that gives us kind of a sense of where it was. And then in combination with the collection date and the year, um, we can actually look how um, fluctuations over the last 150 years in, because we have specimens that go back that far, um, how those affected flowering times. And so one of the interesting things that David found was that uh, this particular plant is really sensitive to changes in water availability, so rainfall, but not so much temperature increase. Um, and so what we're going to expect is that each, each species is going to respond differently. And right now, what we need to do is use these specimens to, to generate more case studies so that we can begin generalizing about climate change responses. Um, so I want to kind of just shift gears a little bit here now. and. Um, and kind of bring it back down. So these are some of these kind of big, big, broad brush, big geographical scale questions. And I want to kind of like zoom in more on this kind of middle scale. Because um, a lot of the questions that we're really interested in with species distributions and species interactions, um, they don't work so well with the broad brush. And you really need to kind of get uh, down into the weeds, if you'll forgive me, um, and kind of get into the nitty gritty of, of what these things are doing. Um, so an extreme example of that is uh, another graduate student that I have right now named Charlotte Bonet, um, who's doing some really cool work looking at microclimatic differences of mosses and how that corresponds to physiological differences that might be helping these species to diverge from one another evolutionarily. Um, so we've got, uh, by microclimate, I really mean microclimate. So these are little, what are called eye buttons, which is a little climate sensor. It's about as big as a nickel. And so you put it right there just you know, a few millimeters above the surface of a moss. Um, and here's a, a humidity profile from um, the different colors or, or different moss patches. Um, and so each one of these fluctuations is one day. And so you can see the humidity go kind of up and down and up and down. And um, you know, over the course of the months of a growing season, these moss, moss patches are actually experiencing really different microclimates you know, at a kind of shoelace scale, uh, which is very, very different from the, you know, the way we typically do climate modeling for bigger plants. Um, and um, so we think that these really fine scale kind of microclimate differences correspond to basic physiological differences, which corresponds to these things kind of uh, separating evolutionarily. Um, 
Um, and so uh, Charlotte's testing that. Um, another project uh, that we're working on, um, and this is in collaboration with Tracy Massey, which is a NSF postdoc um, who uh, lives here in the South Bay. And so she is mentoring a bunch of San Jose students. So we mentor students together. Um, and she's uh, very interested in this kind of question of how species form, um, but from the, the perspective of flowering plants. And um, so we're working together in the lab on uh, these uh, wildflowers called Western wallflowers. And there's uh, some number of species in Western North America, and nobody really knows. It's one of these problems where, um, you know, anybody you ask will tell you a different number. Um, and what's cool about them is they live on really, really harsh soils. And so you can see from both of these photos, you know, this is on some nasty road cut, and this is in like a cobble field. Um, but there's a lot of variation in the different kinds of poor soils that they occur on. Um, and it seems like some of these poor soils may or may not be correlated to different flower colors. Um, and so you can see the range of variation here. Um, and this doesn't even capture the whole range of variation in flower colors. So they go all the way from this kind of lemon yellow to orange, all the way through fire engine red on one end, and then back through lemon yellow all the way to white on the other end, which is a crazy amount of color variation for one quote unquote species of flower. Uh, and then the other kind of really attractive um, piece of, of this particular puzzle is that uh, it contains several of what we think are species or subspecies uh, that are actually state and federally listed. Um, and so these are plants that uh, have a really like clear conservation priority. <clears throat> um, so the questions we're asking again is just these really basic questions of how many species are there and what caused these species to form, assuming there are more than one species. You know, was it pollinators? Is it soil specialization? Is it climate? Is it non-adaptive responses? Just like physical distance is enough to keep these things apart. Um, we don't really know. Um, and so what we're doing is um, kind of a combination of, of uh, several different approaches uh, that I'll explain. Um, so one of the, the ways that we approach this in botany is to do what's called a reciprocal transplant experiment. Um, and this, uh, this work was done by Jessica Trow, who's a, another recent undergrad, uh, who's now working at a, a biotech, but still shows up in the lab to continue working on the project, which is great. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple design where you take uh, several different populations from several different soil types, and then you grow each population up on each different soil type. So you get every possible combination between population and soil. Uh, and then, of course, you replicate that a bunch of times. Um, and so this is kind of uh, what this looks like. You can see that all the different colors of, of soil that we have in here. And um, so this is what our uh, experiment looks like. We uh, do our greenhouse work just up on top of the greenhouse up in uh, the top of Duncan Hall. Uh, if you haven't been up there, uh, there's a bunch of research space. And so uh, Jessica grew up 1,200 plants over the course of last spring and into the summer. Um, and then uh, this is one of the more compelling graphs that I think we've um, come up with over the last couple of years out of the lab. And so what we've got here is survivorship on the y-axis. So this is the proportion of the plants that made it through the experiment. And so we've got our different soil uh, types here. Um, and so you can see on this one soil type called serpentine, uh, which is a really, really harsh uh, soil for plants. It has a lot of heavy metals. Um, it has a really um, sort of off-putting ratio of calcium to magnesium that plants really don't like. Um, so there's a lot of challenges of it uh, on it. And, and because of that, species that can live on that soil very often diversify from their parent lineages. And so this particular soil type is known in California as being a kind of a new species machine. Like it just makes new, new plant species. And so what you can see that it's doing here is, um, so the serpentine population, uh, which is the dark blue bars, um, doesn't do very well on its own soil type. Uh, but if you look at the difference between the blue and the other bars, you know, they're all pretty similar here, pretty similar here, pretty similar here. And then if you look at the difference here, what this is showing you is that all the other populations do really terribly on the serpentine soil. Um, and the serpentine population doesn't do particularly well, but it does much, much better than these other soil types. And this is a really clear example of local adaptation. So this population is, is much better adapted to that nasty soil than the other populations are. And so this is like, like great evidence of that kind of the first initial stages of where adaptation can potentially 
get kind of co-opted by natural selection to actually drive populations away from each other to form new species. And there's no guarantee that that's going to happen, but uh, when it starts, this is exactly what it looks like. So this is a really exciting system to be working in. So we, we kind of captured um, that process in action. Um, so I have another grad student who is uh, kind of following up on that project. Um, and she's interested in, um, in using the same kind of a design where you take different populations and grow them up on different soils, um, but just looking at different sort of flavors, you wouldn't call it that, different types of serpentine soils from around California. Because um, serpentine is, is actually a kind of heterogeneous um, assemblage of different rock types that all share some, some properties, but they come from different geological formations and that emerge at different times in geological history. And so what Charlotte's really interested in is asking the question, um, you know, if a plant evolves onto serpentine, does that give it sort of tolerance to all the different kinds of serpentine? Or does each kind of independent colonization of serpentine, is that a, a sort of potentially new and different speciation event? So are we talking about potentially one new species forming or dozens? Um, and, and it could be either way. And um, we've shown from the other work um, that this system is like a perfect system for actually like catching that process as it happens. Um, and so Charlotte is, is just starting out. She's collected her seeds and she's gonna be doing uh, that work this spring uh, in our greenhouse. Um, and then uh, finally, one, one more project I wanna talk about is uh, um, something that I've done with a couple of recent uh, undergrads. This started out as a, a COVID project um, that evolved into a cool methods paper that we've been invited to submit um, to a, a methods journal in botany. Um, and it's using the same system of wallflowers uh, to look at the spatial distribution of color in wallflowers and, and using citizen science data to ask that question. Um, and so we're interested in, first of all, is flower color randomly distributed? Um, is if it's not randomly distributed, is it driven by climate? Is it driven by potential pollinator communities? Or, or what is it that's actually causing um, the different flower colors to occur where they do? Um, and um, so what uh, Yvonne and Ariel and I have done is, is built this, um, this app, uh, an R Shiny app, that has a kind of similar function uh, to ImageJ, which I'm sure a lot of you have used to, to collect data from images in different contexts. Um, but the cool thing about this pipeline is that it kind of interfaces directly with iNaturalist queries. So you do a big search. And so for us, something like, give me all the records of uh, wallflowers in North America. And then you can take that and then really quickly um, collect data from all those images. And so it'll have all the metadata. Um, so all the, the time and location data from those records. And then you just add the color data that you collected from the image. Um, and so this map that we're looking at is a, is a map of uh, about 5,000 citizen science records. And the plotting color is the actual color from the images. Um, and so we can actually see how color is distributed across the landscape. Um, and then, of course, you know, without citizen science data, it would take us you know, decades to, to compile a data set like this. Um, so it, it really opens a lot of doors for looking at really broad scale patterns um, very efficiently. Um, so some of the things that we're doing uh, with that data set is, is using kind of similar randomizations to the ones I was talking about with the spatial file genetics. Um, but we can look at, at different regions uh, throughout the range that have, um, that are, for example, more yellow than you'd expect by chance, or more red than you'd expect by chance. Um, so you know, how mean color uh, across populations is spread across the entire range. Um, and then we can also look at, at patterns, non-random patterns of variance in, in population color. So which populations are more heterogeneous in color than you'd expect by chance versus which ones are more homogeneous. Um, so that's the, the blue and red. So you can see the, the really heterogeneous populations are really down here in the Southern Rockies, uh, which is also kind of the concentration of where the, the really red flowers are. Um, and so the kind of the broad picture here is that uh, throughout most of the range, uh, there's a lot of yellow. And then there's just a few areas that have a lot of orange and red flowers but there's no areas that have only orange and red flowers. Um, so there's some pattern there that we're still disentangling. Um, and then we can also look at how these kind of color patterns are distributed with respect to environmental gradients. And so just some, some real simple patterns are ones like this. So on the x-axis, so there's two regions, the Sierra Nevadas in California and the Southern Rockies of New Mexico and Arizona. 
And so on the x-axis here, we've got color. So this is a measure of color from red to yellow. Um, and then on the y-axis is elevation. And so you can see from these correlation coefficients, and it's kind of hard to see just looking at it, but the correlation coefficients for a citizen science eco ecological data set are really, really strong. Um, and so what, what we've got here is as you go uphill in the Sierras, you go from orange to yellow, a really strong signal there. Um, and, but no red flowers in California. But then when you go to the Southern Rockies, you get the opposite pattern where you get red flowers up at the top of the mountain and then you go down to get the yellow. So you've got this kind of crisscross pattern in these different parts of the ranges. And that's another interesting thing about these kind of really broad um, scale citizen science data is that, that you'd never notice these patterns until you, you see the whole thing together and then you can start analyzing little subsets of the data uh, separately. Um, so we're really excited about publishing that tool, as well as just kind of incorporating this kind of broad, uh, these broad scale analyses in with um, the, the greenhouse work. And then also with some work that, um, that Tracy, the postdoc, is, uh, is doing uh, with genomics of these same populations. So she's got about 80 populations sampled, and she's working up the genomic data right now, um, about 2,000 individuals from across those 80 populations. Um, and we've also got... Um, calibrated uh, images to, to take a nice fine scale look at, at color variation within these populations um, to help us understand how patterns of gene flow across the, lake, uh, the um, distribution correspond to things like the flower color and climatic gradients um, and soil type um, and all these things. Um, so uh, a lot of kind of fun projects sort of just, just getting going with the wallflowers. Um, so to kind of wrap it up, um, the, the kind of take home of this, hopefully, is, um, you know, kind of going back to the, the first slide in the talk, uh, the world is a changing place, and it's just changing more and more quickly um, out there, uh, and we all know that, um, and so the question is, is how do we study distributions um, in a way that, that kind of transcends scale, because the, the conservation problems are happening across scales from um, you know, tiny parcels of land to entire continents, you know, counties, states, nations. Um, you know, conservation and species distributions are interacting at all these different scales. And so we need to study these patterns across all these different scales. And we need to train students to, to think about these problems uh, across all these scales. Um, and and uh, each one of these kind of points along these spectra have really important insights uh, to give us um, as we sort of focus on uh, where these plants live and how to protect them. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to um, finish by, by thanking uh, the funding agencies that have um, provided support for the work. And obviously my, my co-PI, uh, Tracy, who's done a lot of the um, supervision of the greenhouse work and then the genomics work with the wallflowers. And then uh, Lars Rosengreen, who's uh, one of our technicians in the biology department, and takes care of our uh, greenhouses and helps out a lot in the herbarium. If you didn't see this, this uh, Lars got a lot of press uh, just a few weeks back for growing this. This is one single flower, the quartz flower, if you didn't see it. Um, uh, so Lars is a tremendous asset uh, to all of us in the biology department. Uh, and then, of course, um, all these students, which hopefully you've gotten the impression um, that it's a ton of fun uh, doing these projects uh, with all these young people. Um, so if we have time for questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. So if you don't mind, I'll start with the first question. Um, I wanted to ask, I thought it was really interesting, the differences that you were seeing between the flowering plants in Northern California versus the mosses. And I'm just wondering, like, has anybody done that for other continents? Do they see similar things like in South America or, or in Europe, which might have more similar climate or has it just not been done? Uh, it hasn't been. So this this field is just kind of just getting going. Um, and um, they're starting to do a lot of interesting work with that in Australia. Um, so the folks that are doing this kind of research are, are based either here in California or in Australia. Um, but we haven't really done any of these like explicit kind of comparing different branches of the tree of life yet. Um, it would be surprising to me if within the next three or four years, we don't have a bunch of papers like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's been one, actually one that, that compares 
butterfly distributions in North America to, to flowering plant distributions. Oh, wow. um, and because you know butterflies yep. and flowers are obviously tightly linked to pollination in our rivery. Um, and um, so people are beginning to, to kind of do that and to kind of add in some of these like ecological networks that are probably really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But um, the first papers in this field were just published maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So it's still kind of building momentum. Well, maybe some potential collaborations for you and Fred then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, everyone else, if you want, you are welcome to put questions in the chat or also in the Q&A. And also we can take questions from here. And I'm actually going to mute in a second to, um, so that Ben can be the one talking. Um, OK. I have a question about your um, about that uh, figure of the species description of mosses over time, and I was wondering, I don't know if you know this from that data, the increase in descriptions over the last you know 10, 20 years, is that from you know uh, description based on specimens out and collected out in the field, or or does any of that have to do with Discovery the species as a like DNA barcoding. Yeah, yeah. So the, the question uh, from the live audience here was um, for that, like the new species accumulating through time, um, like where, where are those species coming from, basically? Um, I didn't talk about this little inset in there that actually breaks down uh, species study using molecular data versus not. Um, and it's about 80% not. Um, so this is just people going out and looking and finding new stuff. And um, there are, and, and that graph kind of tucked off to 2015. Um, and so in the last five or seven years, there's been a bunch more molecular stuff, but uh, that just reflects the, um, mostly the age of the people describing new species and what they're good at um, for the most part. But, um, but yeah, for the most part is people, so uh, either doing field work or just, Going through herbaria and saying that looks different, you know, and um, yeah, and um, so once we start doing more, like there, there's a few groups that are doing a lot of the genetic work, and um, those guys are just describing new species left and right as well. So um, yeah, it's super super active, and uh, if we just had more people working in mosses, we would have a lot more species. Actually, I have another question. Do citizen scientists, do they ever send back samples so that you could sequence them? Or do the citizen scientists just kind of take the pictures and do a kit and all that? Yeah, so, so the question is, do citizen science actually ever collect samples and send them in? Um, it's super rare. Um, but you, when that does happen, usually it's like a um, somebody will take a picture of something really interesting. And then someone like me will see it and be like, where do you see that? <laughs> Did you like, can you know, can you go get some? If it's something like a plant, obviously if it's an insect or something, it's much harder to, to do. But um, no, it's pretty rare. Cause, and that's, I mean, that's the kind of the beauty of the citizen science kind of paradigm yeah. is just people are out there with their iPhones taking pictures of everything. Yeah. Um, and then when they upload them, these data sets are massive and they grow really quickly. And the other really cool thing about them um, is their, uh, there's there's no lag temporally um, in um, the data. So what we do with the wallflowers um, is because the blooming time is different every year, just depending on the rainfall. Um, and so when we want to like take these pictures that are calibrated, what we do is we look on iNaturalist to see where people are taking pictures, you know, over the last week. Um, nice. And um, so it's become a really important tool for um, for at least flowering plants. People don't really take pictures of moss, but um, you know, they can be forgiven for that. <laughs> um, but uh, the, in, in terms of there not being a lag, uh, it's also really great for things like invasive species because um, the process of like a scientist like me collecting a physical specimen, identifying it, processing it, getting it into an herbarium, uh, it's that very commonly six months or a year to go through that. Like, because, you know, we're all busy and there's lots of specimens. Um, uh, but as opposed to, you know, it's instantaneous with iNaturalist. And so for things like tracking phenology and tracking invasive species, um, the citizen science data sets were just kind of at the tip of the iceberg of like what we can do with them. Uh, it's really, really exciting. Yeah, wow.
Amazing. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Ben. Wonderful talk. All right, and have a wonderful weekend, everybody.